<laughs> All right, we're going to start with um, Kevin, and uh, he's going to give us a, a welcome and then an update from the call with the governor yesterday. And then one thing that's not on our agenda there's some planning going on for a webcam support teachers and Kevin's going to discuss that as well. Um, then we've got Tony on the line, our director of communication, who is going to talk about the student advisory group that was brought together last week and in preparation as well. And Jeff did a play with those students. She'll give us a recap on that. And then we're going to turn it over to Rob Akers, who's going to talk about Teach Peter Labelle and OJ. So with that, I am turning it over to Kevin. Thank you, Karen. I want to welcome everyone. I know um, we have busy days um, with uh, meeting after meeting, and I want to, and I know you're working with your respective members of your groups that you represent and doing. Uh, work in your own right so I want to thank you for taking time out of your a day and your agenda to advise us and help us <clears throat> um, I know that this is uh, obviously you all are aware of the uh, governor's announcement yesterday and the governor held a call with the superintendents uh, yesterday afternoon and of course announced the recommendation to close schools to in-person classes for the remainder of the year as well as student activities and then, of, uh, of course, went on during the conference to talk about um, graduations and proms that could not be held in an in, in person. Um, over the weekend, uh, we worked on developing an education continuation plan, anticipating that would be the governor's announcement. And of course, the governor's announcement is based upon uh, and the recommendation is based upon uh, the criteria coming and the phased approach coming from the Centers for Disease Control that the, the White House has pushed out. And so, of course, Kentucky is following that as well. And uh, there's what's called gating criteria that has to be met, uh, which you've heard the governor talk about having a downward trajectory of uh, the COVID <clears throat> so, uh, illness uh, within a 14 day period. And, you know, a downward trajectory of 14 days of uh, uh, reported cases, and that's even before you get to phase one. And then when you get to phase one is when you're talking about very limited activities with uh, uh, 10 individuals or less. And then the phase one criteria still does not recognize an opening of school. So when you take the gating criteria and the phase one and you overlay that on our school calendars, there was just no way that schools can open um, to to in person classes. I'm, I'm getting some feedback, so I don't know if Karen, can you mute uh, everyone? Okay, yeah, that's better. All right. Um, and so there was just no way we could open to in-person classes. So the education continuation plan uh, takes us forward through the rest of the year. It is a document that was released yesterday and that was sent out uh, statewide. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to read it. And it again just summarizes and, and puts more detail on what school will look like for the remainder of the year. As you all know, Senate Bill 177 was passed by the General Assembly as a uh, type of COVID-19 relief uh, in various uh, areas for school districts, a lot of technical things that needed to be addressed. And uh, part of that bill talks about that schools should still reach 1,062 hours on or before June 12th. Uh, and then the commissioner and the department was directed to work with school districts to, if they could not achieve 1,062 instructional hours, um, work with them on a plan to do that. And then if they could not do that, the commissioner had the authority to waive the 1,062 hours. Well, when that bill was written by the General Assembly, I still think we were all thinking that there would be a time when we would be back in in-person classes. I, I remember in the middle of March, you know, May 1st seemed a long way away and we kept using that kind of as a benchmark day uh, and saying, let's try to get six weeks of our plan for at least six weeks of non-traditional instruction. And, you know, and now we know that we're not going to be able to be in classes. And so some parts of 177 don't fit very well just because I think they were talking about coming back into in-person classes. The point being though, the General Assembly 
still wanted districts to get to 1,062. Uh, the governor also mentioned in a press conference last week when he was asked whether he had the legal authority to waive 1,062 under his emergency uh, authority. He indicated that he did and that he would obviously be discussing uh, that issue with superintendents, but he also made the comment we also need to make sure that uh, we don't allow this type of crisis to uh, further interfere with the education of our students. He said it much better than that. Um, and so this plan was drafted uh, after feedback from talking to all of you uh, through these, these this task force, um, to, uh, various conversations with superintendents with the idea of trying to get to 1,062 for every school district, knowing that some school districts are going to hit their 1,062 as early as this week. We believe there's at least one district that will hit 1,062 on April 24th, but then we also know there are other districts because they started doing NTI the, for the first time this year after the COVID pandemic started and they took and uh, uh, time to get their teachers up and running, which was a great decision for them to take that time. And then they didn't start NTI until April 7th, one of those being Jefferson, Faye, I think was in a similar situation. And so they would not be, at least I know Jefferson would not be reaching 1,062 until June 3rd. So we wanted to try to get every district to 1,062, but also do something that could back down the number of days. And so what we're doing is we're allowing every district to count every NTI day used this year as seven hours. That's currently permitted for districts that already have a seven hour day and there are just a handful of those. And so we already had districts counting that as a seven hour day, but we also had districts counting an NTI day as a six hour day because their normal day was a six hour day or in the equivalent of those minutes. And sometimes they would have to count the lowest number of the, maybe they had an elementary that was at six hours, but the high school is at six and a half or vice versa. They'd have to go with the lowest. So we're going to throw all that out and every district can use seven hours for their NTI instruction. That doesn't mean they change the type of NTI instructions. You have to add, somehow add another hour of activities. It just means that for accounting purposes for this year, every school district can use in account seven hour. An NTI day is a seven hour day and that even goes back to NTI days the districts may have used prior Prior to COVID for flu or snow. What that does is that get that uh, gives districts a, a few more days uh, that, that they can close earlier. So uh, for example, Jefferson will be able to close the last week of May. I think Fayette's in a similar situation. Uh, Garrett County, for example, where I'm sitting right now, I think they were going to uh, finish their last instruction day on May 15th at 1062 with using the seven hours. I think they can be on or around May 12th. And so that adds uh, some some gives districts a little bit of an allowance and address the f fatigue issue a little bit. But the most important thing is the plan gets every kid the equivalent of 1062 hours. Yes, we know it's NTI instruction. We know it's not exactly the same as hour to hour instruction and it's not supposed to be. Uh, but we that is a baseline that I think we can all be proud of. Um, we had a teacher advisory call today and maybe they were just so exhausted they didn't even want to raise their hand and say anything, but uh, they indicated that they were in. They, I think their silence, I hope, indicated they were in for this fight and they were ready to continue forward. Uh, I think the majority of districts will end somewhere in mid-May. Um, so I think we've we struck a good compromise here. There, I will mention there are two off-ramps. Um, we wanted to make sure that if a, particularly the districts that are going to have to go longer into May, if there were extraordinary circumstances, logistical hardships, or, and I don't even really want to think about this or mention this, but public health reasons, meaning their teaching core started getting COVID or getting sick and could, could deliver NTI or other public health reasons that would uh, deem inadvisable even having NTI. There are two off ramps, one being the commissioner's authority to waive the 1062 as anticipated by Senate Bill 177 or option two. Again, the governor's authority under the emergency order he has issued to waive the 1062 if a district needs to finish early. At this point, at this time, assuming the rate of cases kind of stays the same, that we continue to have a healthy teaching force, uh, I don't anticipate any district needing to utilize that extraordinary relief, but it is there in case we have to use it. So uh, that's a very long winded uh, 
summary of probably everything you already knew. I know uh, that it does raise some additional questions. And of course, the next questions are how are we going to deal with graduation? The governor talked about there are basically two options. You need to either do a virtual graduation or some type of a drive in drive through uh, using those same requirements that churches are using that the governor has repeated and we'll be providing those to districts um, if they want to go that route. We have heard from students through the superintendent student or the commissioner student advisory council that they actually would prefer delaying graduation until late summer or early fall to take to be able to have an in-person ceremony. We did talk about that on the call with the governor yesterday. And the problem with that is if you completely forego doing some type of virtual or drive in during graduation season in May and you wait with your fingers crossed, hoping we'll hope hoping we would be in phase three, for example, by August or set. Um, uh, August or uh, September, then you know there, there's a chance that we would not be we would be still be in phase one or phase two, and that, for example, if you were in phase two and you had an event, uh, you'd have to make sure every person had gloves on, had personal protective equipment, had masks on, so it becomes a logistical issue. So, I think the advice that superintendents took away from there was. Ideally, yes, we want to be able to have some type of an in-person ceremony for kids at some point, uh, even even if it were the early fall. However, we do know in reality there could be a chance that that would even be restricted. So we probably need to take advantage of doing some type of virtual recognition um, on or around the you know last day of instruction or during you know late May or whenever you would normally have your graduate graduation ceremonies. There is a uh, idea coming out of Mississippi that's being shared around with superintendents today and I have forwarded that to the governor's office to get their feedback through public health and that option is a very highly choreographed option. However, it sounds very it sounds promising, but a school at high school in Mississippi is scheduling each senior at a certain time. They can come with only four members of their immediate family. Uh, they have a photographer that takes a picture from a distance with their cap and gown. The senior proceeds into the auditorium or the gym. There's the I assume the superintendent and maybe the principal six feet apart and the student gets their diploma six feet apart, walks across stage, a picture, a video is taken. And then the next person comes in the next five minutes um, and and then the district would blend those videos together to have a seamless graduation ceremony that would then of course be distributed or played throughout the community. Again, a lot of creative things going on around the country and, and, and also here in Kentucky, but a lot of the that idea from Mississippi would be a very um, logistically would be very difficult and you all, you all know from previous experience there we always have family members mine included that would want to bring cowbells and air horns etc so um, I don't say that to discount that or to make fun of the issue but just know that a lot of the options have um, would take a lot of work from staff and a lot of planning but I also, also know we owe it to kids to try to think outside the box and do the best we can so just know if you've seen that idea, we are uh, asking the governor's office to give us some feedback and we're asking the governor's office because obviously they are leading us in how this is affected by public health and are being advised by the minute by Dr. Stack and his team. So we don't want to do anything to frustrate that and we obviously don't want something to show up on the news that was unintended uh, just because we didn't give you the, the best guidance and advice uh, from the state level. So I probably said too much, Karen, uh, but um, that uh, does lead us. And I guess you wanted me to touch a little bit on before we talk about the guiding question. We are going to want to in uh, the education continuation plan. I did stress that uh, we are going to redouble our efforts at the department to give guidance to districts that are continuing or particularly will be continuing NTI through the better part of May and uh, and also gear it towards districts that are new to NTI. As most, as you all know, we had over half of the districts came on to NTI because of COVID-19, and many of those districts were also not not participating in <clears throat> summer feeding, or some of them were not. And so, literally in an overnight uh, overnight, they began delivering NTI instruction and delivering food in 
to doing it in spaces that they had never encountered, which is history will show is an amazing feat that we've done that in Kentucky. We've served 4.6 million meals to 230,000 kids in the month of March. Absolutely amazing. Um, but we are going to convene um, a, a webcast uh, and uh, to give a, assistance and multiple webcasts if needed for uh, particularly geared towards teachers and principals about best practices around NTI, not directives from the state of how to do NTI, but a reminder of best practices, talking about project based learning, competency based learning. Um, uh, bring on an elementary, middle, and a high school teacher just to kind of share uh, best practices, war stories, that kind of thing, to give as much support as we can. We also know that you're doing that as well through your organizations, and I want you to keep that up. Uh, I, in passing, I saw one of the co-ops, I think, brought in a national speaker uh, talking about how do you know if you're reaching your kids uh, through non-traditional instruction? And I'm, so I know you all are really doing a good job and just keep that up, knowing that we will have uh, districts um, in NTI through the last week of May. So Karen, I'll turn it over to you if you want to take us through the guiding question and obviously can we want to take feedback from the members and then in, in any questions they may have. Certainly. So our guiding question around these topics is how will this guidance or recommendation affect this school term? So let's open it up and uh, feel free to open up your mics and give some feedback. Karen, can you repeat that a little bit? Sure. How will the guide, how will this guidance affect this school term? And you don't have to, it doesn't have to be specifically about that. Just what are your, what are your thoughts around the recommendations so far that, uh, that Kevin talked about, whether it be about extending the school year, well, it, continuing NTI or around uh, graduation and how we plan to, to work with teachers. Well, I think uh, this is Nancy Hutchinson, KEDC. <clears throat> I think from what I can understand, trying to be realistic here, but politically correct too, um, they're all getting a little restless. Uh, the teachers are stressed out. The students are stressed out. We're hearing behaviors from kids that normally are more social. They're going to their rooms, shutting the doors. Um, non-respondent to parents when they are outside if somebody comes near them they start freaking out getting behind their parents um i think the mental health piece of this is going to reverberate more so than the cognitive piece of this so at kedc we're looking at doing some mental health pieces and um trying to help we've we've been meeting with uh, guidance counselors and those folks, but I think it's going to take everybody and it's going to take um, some help for those teachers too. Thanks, Nancy. We've got a question from from Rhonda. How are the days the staff still has to work after the 1062 being calculated? Yeah, thank you for and Nancy also thank you for that that you know we needed to redouble our mental health efforts uh, even before we were in a pandemic uh, and you know that was obviously a, a topic of discussion related to, to school violence and school shootings but then also it's it's ever more present now so thank you for that and um, that's that's uh, that's right on um, the nose of what we need to be doing. Um, the 10, the 1062 to answer the question is not, does not satisfy contract issues um, in and of itself. So um, you still have your separate contract day requirement for your staff. And there are several ways to work through that. Uh, one of them, of course, is you want to try to be as creative as possible to have activities uh, if once you get past your instructional days to satisfy those contracts that will benefit, of course, teacher planning for next year, uh, any type of accelerated learning opportunities that you're going to roll out uh, virtually or this summer. Um, and of course, professional development, 
and, and virtually and uh, PLC meetings that may be uh, virtual or and and using that and not having, of course, in service meetings that you meeting in person. And I know that's easier said than done sometimes, for, particularly for specific other role groups that uh, it may not be possible for. The second option you have or you can use and obviously you use these in combination would be a use of emergency days to satisfy your contract days that is permitted and anticipated by Senate Bill 177 that gives special legal authority to local boards of education to uh, create emergency days as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. I believe it leaves it pretty open-ended as far as um, when and how and why you would have those days. And again, that's under your local board authority. Todd Allen, I think we had a similar question yesterday. Is that, do you agree with that or an answer? And do you have anything else to add? Yes, that's correct. On the um, emergency day provision, um, I would encourage any school district to review the policies that they have in place where their boards may have already granted some level of authority to the superintendent to um, look at granting emergency days. But Kevin's analysis is absolutely correct. Senate Bill 177 gives that authority and flexibility to the local board to determine um, if it is necessary to grant days. It's not an absolute requirement, but if it is necessary to grant days, and if so, what the criteria for granting those days will be. And that is one option that a district may utilize to ultimately satisfy contract days for the current school year for um, staff, both certified and classified. And, and as an thank you, Todd. And as an example, I had a, a text conversation with the superintendent today, and the superintendent was asking this very same question. It was like, "Look, I, I've got ten days that I just can't." I said, "You know, our, our, we're we're burned out, and we, you know, what are my options?" And of course, the emergency day option of granting uh, some of those days, or I guess technically all of them, uh, as emergency days, could be under the purview of that superintendent's board. And, uh, and so I know you're wrestling with those issues about um, if you had a planning day or your is your staff so exhausted that it would not make sense to even have a planning day and uh, would that be better served as just an emergency day um, and, and end out the year. Okay, Kevin, we've got another question around uh, students being able to get their personal items from school with with the closing happening so suddenly. What is there any guidance around students getting their personal items? We don't have guidance on that yet. We will have guidance on that, um, and that um, uh, if you can, Karen, make a note of that. And Kevin, and Tony. this is Amanda. We're actually okay. going to address that tomorrow with Pratt. Okay, good. Um, and get feedback. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, um, that since that's tomorrow uh, and we're getting our advisories in, um, Mary and Eddie, to your point, there's been a lot of questions about how to close up the school year. And, you know, there are a lot of procedures around that. And so actually Kelly Foster and I being former principals, we feel that uh, a little bit of stress. And so we're going to guide that uh, conversation tomorrow with principal advisory to start that conversation to come up with guidance. Of course, we'd run that through legal to make sure everything is is covered. Um, but we know that there are concerns around belongings and how do you bring folks in the building to stay safe and still follow the governors um, and the health, uh, your local health department's guidelines to keep people safe. So we will have feedback on that. I, again, Kevin, apologize for interrupting. Nope, I want you to. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, I can envision some type of a scenario, you know, where you have a line of cars coming through and you know, and depending on what needs to be returned, the KHSAA, I talked to Commissioner Tackett this morning, they have similar questions from uh, coaches and parents and others and students about how to return district owned athletic equipment and uniforms, et cetera. And so uh, KHSAA uh, will be following the same guidance that will then be that we're going to uh, seek the advice from principals tomorrow. So they'll, they'll be using the same protocol. OK, I don't see any other questions, so I think we're ready to go on to the next topic. Karen, uh, and that's going to. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is Dave Johnson. I, I guess I've got a, a question in this. Um, we we were talking with some of our districts this morning. We've got some of the guys as, as many as 10 days left after NTI is over. Some have three. And um, 
Well, I think part of our concern is preparation for next year um, and that those contract days at the end of the year could be a good way to do that. But obviously, if some choose to take emergency days rather than use those days, I guess my question is, how then could districts bring staff in to do that prep work in the summer uh, even if maybe if they if they're planning on doing some work with students over the course of the summer, could federal funds that we've been talking about be used to pay folks to do that, or or how would that work if a district were to just grant all those as emergency days at the end of the year? Hey, Kevin, this is Kelly. I'll take a shot at that. Um, so, of course, you know, we are looking at the CARES Act and the federal funding that will come from CARES. Uh, we have been participating in several webinars with CCSSO on the use of those funds uh, and the flexibilities with those funds. We are still waiting on Ed's guidance on that. Um, so we do think there'll be some opportunities for um, possible intervention or remediation programs if it's safe to come back together in July and August. You know, we've got to think about the health health concerns first, uh, but we do think there'll be some flexibility with those funds uh, for those type of programs and possibly even what you're talking about, uh, David, bringing staff in to plan for the reopening of school. So, uh, you know, we're partnering with CCSSO, US Ed, we're getting ready to partner with SREB uh, on their task force around reopening. So, we, we don't have any solid guidance on that, but that is slowly starting uh, to come together. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Is that, thinking about it, to me, it looks like there's really three big questions that uh, we seem to keep coming back to. One is we do in the course of the summer uh, to try to reduce the slide. What do we do next fall to try to deal with the slide and the gaps that have been created? And then the third question being, what do we do if, if we have a resurgence of COVID, how are we better prepared? So it seems like there's, at least in our thinking, there's, there's at least three big elements that school districts are, are gonna have to think about. Again, one being, how do we intervene on the slide? The second one being, how do we uh, deal with the gaps, and the third being, how do we better prepare so that if this were to happen to us again next fall or winter, whenever, that we can uh, be better prepared for it then. So I think I would agree with you on all three of those and, and can let you know that those are three areas that we are talking about internally and that many national organizations are starting to discuss as well. So, um, you know, we will definitely come up with some solid guidance in all three of those areas to share. That's great. I, I think that, yeah, those are the questions we're having internally and we're starting to encourage our districts now to begin to transition into those conversations internally um, with their staffs, um, easing people into those conversations. Um, but now that the announcement's been made that we're not coming back this spring, it seems like this is the time to do that. I, I just hope that folks will take the right time, you know, the time that they need to be able to do that and that we can provide the resources for them to do it and and the support and the guidance to really think that through. It may be helpful for them to even think about what some of those questions or, or what are some of the guiding questions to, to dealing with those three big issues what do they need to be thinking about at the district level on that? So I, I'd love to jump in on this, if that's OK, um, it, to kind of piggyback off what Kelly said. We are working on this, David, exactly what you're saying. And actually, um, the webcast that Kevin mentioned earlier is to kind of help process the here and now and how you finish out and kind of enter them into the summer. We actually have a webcast set up for hopefully we're, we're finalizing the time on that webcast for next week. But on the 29th, our standards team has already developed the beginning of a series that they're going to be offering um, that address achievement gap. 
and talking about how teachers can start to prepare now for the fall because we can't put a class of 24 first graders into intervention because they're behind. Uh, that's not going to work. So we're going to have to really, as you were saying, be strategic, intentional, and use the time that we have now to start preparing for those possible discrepancies, which is taking us back into what that progression should be, what students should be expected to do, and what we're going to have to do to reteach and or teach for the first time. And so we actually have that starting next Thursday and then we're going to be building on that series to help um, aid in that uh, in that support for the planning that's going to take place really starting now and throughout the summer um, and we will uh, we already have a lot of facilitation guides around this work around how you develop the curriculum how you're going to know what students know and what they don't know and so we're working on that right now and we'll kick that off next week and make sure you guys have that it just came out today in the Monday Today's Tuesday came out in the Monday message yesterday um, and we will push that out again to make sure everybody knows. And that was the one thing I was going to share, but it's really all about being incredibly sensitive and strategic around um, basically equity uh, and achievement gaps and how we can be proactive to address that right away. But we're right on the same page with you. Um, and as Kelly said, we're working together to um, provide the just in time support for what you guys need. That that sounds really good. I, I... Uh, I would hope that part of that is some type of uh, guiding questions um, that's going to help districts look at some of, of those things on a on a deeper level. Even thinking about what, what resources um, am I going to need in order to do this? For example, if I'm going to address this in the summer, then what you know, am I going to do this technology and a, in a how, how am I going to do this? Um, so, and then you start getting into how can I use federal funds? How can I use all these different resources that are now available to me to do that? So I just think maybe, a, I don't know if a document might help with that, but something that's going to help them begin to think about that and coordinate those resources. Um, and probably the sooner the better, just so that if they're thinking about this spring and time becomes an issue, you know, that's, a, of course, a key resource, then how do I use that best? Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you, David, for your input. I really appreciate it. Hey, David, this is Robin Kenny. If I could jump in for just a minute as well. Um, wanted to share with you that we are going to provide additional information in our superintendent's call this Thursday. We, have of course, are learning more things every day about the CARES Act. Uh, we continue, as Kelly mentioned, to be in conversations with CCSSO and US Ed. Um, we do believe, to your point of what to do over the summer, that there's already some guidance around the use of elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds. That is that larger pot of money, the $194 million that is coming to Kentucky for um, summer learning and supporting the school leaders, um, trying to be prepared and coordinating efforts. Um, so we do think there is some flexibility there um, and we want districts to make those decisions kind of within the parameters, as you suggest, which is giving some good guidance and then letting kind of districts kind of make those decisions. But wanted to make you aware that we'll have more information on Thursday's call about the CARES Act. Still won't have all the answers because we're still getting lots of information. And then, um, as Kelly also suggested, we will provide guidance um, for each of the, the pots of money that are available about permissible uses and how the money is going to flow and all those other things about how we get the money from U.S. Ed to the department and then down to local districts. Sounds great. Thanks, Robin. Really appreciate it. I know it's tough right now because it just seems like this thing is is like jello nailing to a wall. It's constantly shifting and changing and and trying to figure out how all the pieces fit together. So I appreciate you all's hard, hard work on this. So Karen, just to quickly to summarize, and, and David, thank you for bringing that issue up. Uh, we obviously know districts have to make their own decision based on their own circumstances and, and judging the uh, fatigue and other issues that may be affecting their, their uh, workforce. But um, I, I, I agree with everyone. I would hate to see a district uh, put 
uh, 10 days on the shelf as emergencies when we have this extreme need to plan for the next year. And we know that we are going to be having resources to fill those planning days from co-ops, from national uh, providers, all that virtual from the department. And so I, I just, we need to encourage our superintendents to, uh, to continue thinking outside the box, of course, and I hate to keep reusing that but also and i mentioned to a superintendent today you know you don't if your last day of instruction is going to be may 10th and you were going you thought you were going to have to bring teachers in for the next six work days you know you can amend your calendar and you can spread that out your school year technically goes until june 30. i know that raises other logistical issues with um, particularly if you have teachers enrolled in any kind of other um, events or uh, post-secondary learning over the summer, but uh, you know you can be creative with that uh, to address some of your fatigue issues that you're having. So I, I really hope every district will take advantage because this next year is going to be really different. Even if we all show up and uh, every school is filled to the capacity and there are no social distancing, uh, issues on August 15th, it's still going to look so different just because of the way this year ended. Um, and so, uh, as was said, uh, the planning effort is uh, really needed. I would hate to see those days go to waste. All right, great comments. We'll go ahead and move on to the next agenda item. Uh, and Tony is going to, to take control, our Director of Communications, and discuss Student Advisory Group. Tony? Yes. Can you all hear me? Yes. OK, um, so as the commissioner had said, he kind of gave you um, a little bit of the background as to what our students said about graduations, but we also, um, you know, what they thought about in terms of how they would like to proceed. Um, and we do have uh, out of our advisory council, we did have uh, we do have 12 seniors, so it is a very senior heavy council this year and they are from all over the state um some of the they have to come from different supreme court districts and there's at large members and there has to be representative from career and technical um schools as well but in addition to talking to them about um virtual um graduations and what their preferences would be on a on a, a different level we also talked to them about nti and about counseling services and just to get an assessment of how they're feeling at this time about those things. And so I wanted to share with you some of the exit form. Um, I, we gave them an exit form um, and just to give you an idea of how they're feeling um, about some of these ideas. And so um, the question on counseling and what can your counselor or other counselors do right now to better support you and your peers? Um, most of them said that they're doing a great job staying involved in their lives. Um, you know, they're starting Google Classrooms. Um, they think that, um, you know, they hope that they will continue to stay involved even during the summer months. So I do think that even some of the kids are expressing um, concerns about uh, maybe even some anxiety about how the transition will be from this school year to the next. And um, particularly the grade change. Um, and that goes into the um, NTI um, concerns as well for some of our underclassmen on the council. So what their biggest academic concern is right now as we're dealing with this crisis, um, some said college classes, finishing strong and being prepared for next year, AP testing, final exams, um, doing the work but not really learning and transitioning to college. Um, the next one was, I am concerned about AP exams along with the quality of education that I am receiving. I'm a visual learner, so transitioning to NTI has been quite a struggle for me. I am taking an AP exam after I graduate on or about May 14th, and I'm concerned that I won't receive the proper teaching after school is over to ensure that I'm still ready for the exam. And then the other comment is I'm mostly worried about the situation will proceed to worsen until we reach the point that classes are canceled for the rest of the year. And this certain this uncertainty puts a lot more stress on making sure grades are where I want them to be at all times. So you can certainly see that um, their comments are very much aligned with what we've talked about already. Um, and these are things that we, as um, Dr. Ellis has mentioned, that we are addressing. Dr. Damian Sweeney has been on both of our calls with our students, our virtual calls, 
um, just to kind of talk with them about um, just check-ins, how they're doing. We also had two uh, members from the Pritchard um, Committee student voice team uh, talk with them about student voice and ways that they can elevate their voice during this time. And um, so I thought that was very useful. I think Bridget's on, so we appreciate um, lending two of your students um, to use their voice to help uh, these students in particular. And then another good thing that came out of this, um, which we have not done before, is that four of the students have volunteered to write columns for us at the department through Kentucky Teacher. And two of them have already submitted those. And one has been edited and should be up um, probably by the end of the day today or tomorrow. One is a senior, the other is a junior that has submitted. And then in fact, the first one will be from Fleming County. And I'm not uh, sure the other one I think is from, I uh, can't remember where the other one is from. And the other two are also from all different parts of the state. So we are getting a chance to see a lot of um, student voice in this process. And uh, Kevin, I can go back to you if, if you think I've missed anything. No, the one thing I would point out, Tony, is that um, I'm glad you did the exit slips because uh, if you were to take, if our summary of that um, student advisory council meeting would be much more positive if we didn't have the exit slips. The exit slip comments were more, um, had more concerns in them than were voiced, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tony, than was voiced at the actual student advisory council. And that's probably true for all of our advisory. Sometimes folks don't want to maybe say exactly how they feel in an, you know, an open environment. And so I'm glad we had both for both types of forums, both the virtual meeting, but also the exit slips, which we probably should do for uh, start doing for all of our advisories to make sure we're capturing really what everyone set is thinking, um, particularly for those that don't feel like or not uh, don't feel comfortable speaking up during the actual meeting. Yeah, we and we did and I have learned. Obviously, you all know that my background is in media, so I did. I've kind of learned how to be a teacher and start to call on them <laughs> to get them to speak up a little bit. Um, and I do think that you'll be very impressed with how honest they are in their columns and in their student voice pieces. I'm very proud of um, of them being uh, very honest with how their seat, how their year started and how things were going. And then when COVID came in and now how things are going, there's things about course selections and how they're worried about they're not going to get the classes that they want. Um, we have a sophomore that's worried about transitioning to junior year and how this is going to impact her as she um, goes throughout the rest of um, her time in um, in school. And then uh, we will be meeting with them. I mean, typically the advisory council was designed to really meet four times in Frankfurt throughout the year, kind of quarterly. Um, and this, you know, it's kind of one of those things where it's been an unfortunate situation, but this has really given us an opportunity at the department to reshape this council um, and this advisory council to meet uh, more frequently. We're going to meet with them again on Tuesday, May 5th, and uh, really start um just checking in with them more often we know that we can do this virtually now and i think that that'll put on a lot less stress of them having to travel we have two from marshall county that's quite a you know it's quite a drive for them to have to make um they're from all over the state um and so just to try to get their voices heard more often where we can pull them more often um, and then in addition with those 12 seniors um, cycling off the advisory council, we will be putting out probably today. So please be on the lookout if you have nominations for students that you think would be great to serve on this commission, the commissioner's student advisory council, um, please, please uh, nominate them. It'll be through Google form and we'll be putting it out through a media advisory and on social media and the, the nominations will be uh, due or actually be applications. So if you know of an outstanding, it'll be sophomore, incoming sophomore, junior, or senior um, for the 2021 school year. Uh, May 15th is the deadline for that. And um, some of the topics that they would like to see discussed at the future meetings, they obviously would like to have KHSAA um, come in, um, moving into college, implications the virus may have on the transition process, um, one said that they're part of the Kentucky Student Council Association. Um, they would like, you know, they would like to see if it's possible to have 
um, you know, more Pritchard student voice team uh, pre present as well, and then also more discussion on graduation. And that's pretty much all I have. And I can share these um, exit slips with um, a summary of the exit slips with the with the team if you would like. Tony, I will just share and then we can move on to the next. Um, uh, there was a, a video that's been made by the Paintsville High School class of 2020. And I think Tony's sharing it, shared it with the governor's office. I'm not sure if they'll show it on the press or tonight or not, but um, uh, tough to watch in many ways because those students were so honest. It went from every to uh, every senior and they each had something to say. Uh, about their year and talking about how they were the the children of uh, born and during 9-11 and um, but then it ended on such a positive note uh, about how they're ready to face these challenges and uh, just in another and I know we have a lot of those types of things going on social media but it was uh, amazing so uh, Tony if it's not shared out today I want to make sure we share it out through our channels absolutely we will do and then Amanda, uh, I know Kevin already shared a little bit about uh, the graduation from the student survey. Is there anything else you want to share about the, the survey that those students took? Um, not really, just just the um, how adamant they were that it be personal, basically, that they were really <clears throat> before the governor spoke and we understand the health um, concerns. Absolutely. It's just that they just didn't want something one more thing that was virtual and so to kevin's point you know we absolutely want to support what dr stack and the governor have worked so hard to do to keep us safe um, but if there are some creative ways that can be very very well orchestrated and approved um, and working very closely hand in hand with their health department um, it's to really see some kind of efforts to honor those students as individuals i think is really really important and and to emphasize the other piece about that uh, of what they shared in the survey with us is um, they are very concerned about transitions for kids um, they feel like people quit talking about them going to college because they're just talking about nti and so they would like to talk more about transitioning them to college and the students going into middle school or going into high school. So we are working on um, guidance around transitions with Damian Sweeney, Dr. Sweeney, um, and he also has um, a counseling page on the COVID-19 uh, resource for any kind of the mental health, social, emotional supports. There's lots of great resources on there, and I so appreciate everybody really tying that to anything we're doing for students. So um, really it just, um, it's just a very similar message from our students. Um, they're very honest um, and they really do care. So that's pretty much all I have to, to share based on the feedback we got. Okay, thanks Amanda. Before Thank we move on, is there any other feedback around how we can further engage students in decision-making as it pertains to COVID-19? This is Bridget Blum Ramsey with the Pritchard Committee, and I just want to say kudos. Thank you so much to KDE, to um, Commissioner Brown for jumping right in there early on and getting student voice. So thank you. Thanks, Bridget. All right, we'll go ahead and move on to our next agenda item then, teachers helping teachers, and I'm going to turn it over to Rob Akers for that. Rob? Hey, good afternoon, everybody. It's good to be with you. Uh, I'm joined by Dr. Melissa Bell and Dr. O.J. Alika from our public and private and independent institutions of higher ed in Kentucky. And we're here to share some of the different perspectives of what supports are going to be put in place to deal with a variety of our students and even our educators for next year. And I think we all have a little different uh, portion of this presentation. So what I would like to do is start off with Dr. Bell and let her share what's going on with CPE, and then we'll move to Dr. Alika, and then I figured I would close out this portion of the agenda. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. And actually, I have to jump off uh, on this and get on a call with the USDOE about the CARES Act, so this is working out just fine. Um, I wanted to update you. I believe Karen um, asked, uh, a couple of follow-up questions from the last task force meeting and one of it being what are higher ed institutions doing to prepare for this upcoming cohort of seniors who may need remediation or who are anxious about going to college in the fall and um, 
I have surveyed our institutions and I've heard from almost all of them. And so I don't want to go through this point by point, but I do want to to highlight a few things that might help um, help you understand uh, what our institutions are doing. But I can also um, update this document and I will share it with Karen because I told her I have not figured out how to upload it to the chat yet. So. Um, so just some of the highlights, EKU is uh, waiving the test score requirement for admission and actually most of our institutions have gone test optional uh, for admissions purposes in the fall. Um, they are also accepting unofficial high school transcripts for admission decisions and they are extending their scholarship offer deadlines and other deadlines um, for their high school seniors this year. Um, Moorhead State University is going to do one on one onboarding of students virtually uh, at this point, um, and they are also offering peer coaching um, for the for certain uh, students who are um, admitted uh, conditionally. Uh, Murray State provided a very extensive uh, list of resources that they're offering, but one of them I wanted to point out is that they are effective fall of this year. Um, they have hired student success coaches to work with uh, students who have earned a 2.0 or a 2.49 uh, high school GPA. Uh, and those uh, students will re um, receive a range of services from these student success coaches. Um, including mentoring um, and managing the student success contracts, the learning contracts um, that are required for students who have uh, the grade point averages within that range. Um, and also um, a few things that Northern Kentucky University is doing. Um, they are uh, doing some spring and summer outreach to admitted students. They are trying to build community and financial literacy with these students. Uh, they have a wide range of virtual summer registration programs uh, to support faculty, staff, and orientation leaders. Um, and their early alert program, their connect and persist program, um, their support offices in health counseling and student wellness and office of student accessibility are all reaching out uh, to students at this time. So that is not an exhausted list of what is going on, but that is some highlights that I wanted to share today. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, at this point, because I know we're uh, up against some hard stops for our, our partners here. Dr. Olika, would you like to share? Sure, uh, and I'll go really quickly as well. Uh, it's great to go second in higher education since we all work together. A lot of the good stuff has already been said. Dr. Olika, I think we've lost you. I think you're right, Rob. <clears throat> when they freeze up like that, typically it's it's frozen up on their end. Karen, do we want to give him another second to see if he can get back into the meeting? I don't want to miss out on what he has to share. Uh, maybe you can fill in some some blanks, Rob, while we wait for him to rejoin. Yeah, it looks like he just now left the conversation, so we'll see if he can jump back in or, or if that was his hard stop and he may not be coming back in. I don't know. Yeah, OK, well, I can tell you um, when I when I'm able to get into my portion here in just a couple minutes, I'm going to focus a lot more on what the Office of Educator Licensure and Effectiveness is working on to help help provide support for new teachers and for teachers who are going to be re-entering after six months off and for school leaders as well. So we're hoping that we can um, provide some some assistance to help smooth some of this transition and consider some of the folks who've been 
really impacted by this lack of in-person instructing as we especially have so many new teachers ready to enter the workforce. So I tell you what, um, I will go on and start and if it looks like OJ comes back to the conversation, I'll kick to him, um, but I'll just, I'll keep going. So the Office of Educator Licensure and Effectiveness has taken basically three angles in terms of providing support. The first is through regulatory assistance, and that's through our work with the EPSB, through teacher networking and support, and with support for school leaders. And so, and then uh, I guess technically a fourth one, I, I'll just share what we've gathered from just a few of our ed prep provider partners of what they're gonna do in, uh, in response to so many student teachers who are una unable to complete really full, rich clinical experiences with in-person um, training. So first, we is can we get the presentation up, Karen, real quickly? The Office of Educator Licensure and Effectiveness supports the work of the EPSB as well as the Kentucky Board of Education. And in their April meeting, uh, the EPSB really provided broad relief to ed prep providers and to districts and to teachers. Uh, they covered it in a few ways. Um, okay, looks like OJ is back. So let's, let's kick over to him so that he can share before he has to leave. Sure. My apologies. The power just went out of my house, so I don't know if this will mess up again. Uh, but basically, as I was saying, Dr. Bell really covered a lot of the stuff that uh, higher education is doing. I did want to quickly highlight uh, the University of Cumberland's and Bellarmine uh, University. I think they're doing uh, two pretty unique things that are, are really cool. University of Cumberland's is partnering with Knox Promise Neighborhood to offer virtual student success workshops. Uh, and meet and greet opportunities for students from surrounding counties. Uh, that program is going to launch uh, here this month and it will run through the fall semester. Uh, and they, and like a lot of our other institutions, are developing some virtual summer sessions uh, that will promote various successful transition points for college. Uh, and each month will have a different theme and a different topic that they'll target. Uh, and then Bellarmine is doing some cool things too. They've extended their deposit refund deadline for first year students from May 1st to August 15th to help out on the financial side of things. Uh, they are also developing uh, a foundation for college success course offered to incoming students that focuses on uh, Pandemic 101, uh, which I think all of it, obviously uh, all of us would probably need to be in, uh, but I think that would be helpful for students. Uh, and they're providing financial incentives to all incoming first year students to get a jump start on college by enrolling in summer courses, uh, obviously through uh, remote instruction. Uh, but also they're increasing the wraparound services for those as well. So students that need uh, different resources because they're first generation uh, or others, it might be tutoring, mentoring, coaching, writing support, uh, or different learning communities, they'll be doing those things. Uh, and they're also prepared uh, to offer different resources as well uh, as folks may need them. Uh, they are looking at allowing students uh, to defer their scholarship for a semester, uh, but also a year if need be. So there are a lot of different ways that uh, Bellarmine and the University of Cumberland's uh, and uh, IQ institutions are trying to uh, help innovate. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for either Dr. Bell or uh, Dr. Olika? We really appreciate their time today. Looks like we're okay and we're clear. Good luck on your next call. Really appreciate your time. Great, thank you. Yes, thank you. Karen, will we be able to pull up my presentation? Yeah, are you able to do that or do you need me to? No, I need you to, please. Okay. Let me know when you can see it. For some reason, there, it's usually a little bit of a delay when I share things. There we go. Oh, okay. Uh, nope, that's the student advisory. Oh, I got the wrong one. Yes, although I'm sure that was a good one. 
<laughs> okay, let me try that again. Do you see it yet? I think it's on the way. There we go. Okay, just let me know when you want me to advance. All right, if you would take us to um, slide four, please, that'd be great. Okay. Okay, so couple of uh, broad waivers the EPSB granted to provide some relief in an effort to keep the educator pipeline flowing like it like we need it to uh, is we when I say we speaking for the office and the EPSB waived praxis testing for a year and so what that has done is that will allow student teachers and even those who are out there who have maybe struggled with taking the test and had um, portions of the test that they needed to make up a full year on a full provisional certificate to be allowed to teach and to gain employment while they try to uh, take that test once um, ETS is up and running again. They are supposedly putting together some test at home products and methods for teachers to be in pre-service teachers to be able to test. So we'll see if that comes to fruition, but we figured that one year would grant plenty of time, hopefully for there to be a solution in place so that we don't have to disadvantage folks who were caught completely up in situ in circumstances um, well outside of their their scope of influence in addition uh, the epsb waived the mandatory 70 days of student teaching we know in some districts that student teachers are still working very closely with their supervising teachers through nti and providing other supports but we know in other situations that's not been possible and in some cases students have had to move uh, back across the country uh, to their home states because their they their universities closed so we we took this action because we again we didn't want to disadvantage any of our student teachers who have put themselves in a position or got put in a position that they can't do anything about and we have got to keep the supply of teachers coming into our schools especially in the midst of a teacher shortage can we go to the next slide please i'm trying <laughs> here we go thank you Okay, so just quickly in regards to certification, and this will mean um, probably a little bit more to those folks who, who work at the district level and at higher ed, but we've provided some, some different routes for folks who are maybe trying to attain different certifications. Uh, we've got potential principals or prospective principals out there who are looking to try to be certified, move into leadership positions. So this one year provisional certificate counts for folks who are going the, the highly qualified route to add a different certificate for example uh, you may have a teacher who is working uh, as as a foreign language teacher and wants to move over to special education due to uh, reductions in force in the school so where they may have had to pass that praxis prior to being able to move into that position we've provided some relief where they would have a year to make that move same thing for principals and for those folks who are entering the the field through an alternate route in which they could only get in before with a successful praxis assessment okay can we go down to um slide nine please so that's what we're working on for our pre-service teachers want to talk a little bit about what we're doing for our in-service teachers. Um, we, in our Division of Educator Recruitment and Development, we host the Go Teach Kentucky campaign, which has really gotten some nice traction in terms of elevating the profession and advertising to folks uh, who maybe never thought of being a teacher how to get into teaching. But right now, during this COVID crisis, we've had uh, 
some creative work and our division is working to try to connect teachers specifically right now those who have worked in NTI for some years and feel like they've got some proficiency there with teachers who are just now starting into NTI and could really use some teacher to teacher support. So we've created a system of virtual mentors and those we just started that in the last week. We've already had upwards of 80 to 90 teachers who have volunteered to serve as mentors and we are we are working with our advisory groups and our partners to get information out to get other teachers who are looking for support to join in as well. So we're excited about this work. Um, with that, we've also launched through our Go Teach Kentucky. We had our first Twitter chat last week that was all around NTI and we're expecting to host another Twitter chat on the 27th. Um, staff is really excited about that and we're hoping to gain some more momentum with that and please share with any of your teacher partners out there if they are interested. Uh, in addition for next year, we want to try to expand the teachers helping teachers mentors outside of what may be allowed or what is being provided in the schools not to supplant or take the place. We think it's really critical that teachers have mentoring from on the ground, teachers who are in their buildings or at least in their districts. There's so much around onboarding and learning the local culture uh, and just how things work in a district that probably can't be matched uh, from outside the district. So we really, really um, hope that that districts will run with that and we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, in addition, we're going to work to host virtual office hours from experts in the field to provide help around whether it's planning or potential further NTI, around technology, around classroom management, things that teachers struggle with that maybe they don't want to ask someone in their school for support. So we're excited about that coming out as well. So that's what we're looking at in the immediate and short term future for teacher networking and support. If we, okay, I think that covers anything I'll need from the presentation, Karen. So just to share a little bit more about what we're doing for school leaders, we have been working with the Urban Schools Human Capital Academy and our principal partnership pro project or P3 for the last year to develop a toolkit uh, around three main areas and that's for teacher recruitment, teacher induction, which is what they call the new teacher experience, and for teacher retention. And I guess we were fortunate to be working on that work when we did, because I don't think it's ever going to be any more important than it is as we have teachers coming back to this to buildings for in-person education after six months off for bringing in brand new teachers uh, who have never experienced any of this and had greatly reduced time in their clinical experiences and for our folks who are entering through the alt routes who have had almost no experience. So we want to put these tools in the hand of our school leaders because they've got a lot to, to think about in terms of what things are going to look like when they open up next year. So we already have hosted some some trainings with that. We have more that are being scheduled virtually and our P3 team conducts all the certified evaluation training in Kentucky for our school leaders and for the update training as well. And they're going to work this information in there as well to help uh, support our school leaders as they work to support our teachers and students as they come back to school. So just next, know that OELE is having ongoing conversations with our ed prep providers to see what they're doing. This, as uh, Melissa said, is not an exhaustive list. We know some of our partners are planning on uh, providing professional development support uh, especially around classroom management. There's some who have reached out to KEA to, to do some collaborative professional development for new teachers. There's some who really have some um, some strong structures in place, and I'll just highlight two. And again, this is not exhaustive, but uh, Asbury has a really strong collaborative presence with Jessamine County Schools. They participate in the Jessamine Excellence in Teaching Program for new teachers where they serve as mentors on the ground as well. And so they are really providing strong technical assistance as well as 
any um, educational support for the leadership and the teachers there. In addition, Western Kentucky University has a collaborative structure in place with 10 districts that supports a new teacher academy and access to free graduate level programs, including a free course in classroom management that will be available to any of the new teachers in those districts. Uh, that participate, not just Western grads. So those are a couple things that are going on with our EPPs that we think are going to be really supportive and necessary in their districts. And just if you don't mind, if I um, editorialize for just a second, I think this is the the perfect time for our ed prep providers to not let a good crisis go to waste. I think that with school leaders having their bandwidth being taken up and teachers with you by being able to deliver just basic needs, trying to meet that lowest level of Maslow's hierarchy, helping keep them safe and healthy and get them what instruction they can. They are gonna be really needing additional support in terms of providing what current practices and best practices are going on around the country from our ed leaders ability to conduct real time research and to provide technical support to be able to provide maybe some hybrid coaching for their graduates where they're doing some observations and providing feedback, maybe even remotely or virtually. But I don't think I can understate or undersell how needed our ed prep providers are in terms of the support that our local districts are gonna need going back next year and really uh, look forward to partnering with them and looking forward to more of these innovative programs like Western and Asbury and some of the other creative um, ideas that are out there to support our teachers, especially our new teachers and our students going into next year. So that's that's what I have. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Thanks Rob. Rob. And I've, I've put a guiding question out there. What does collaboration look like among districts, KDE and post-secondary institutes in supporting new teachers? So any, any other thoughts around that, um, please feel free to share. I'm not hearing anything. Um, that's all that we had on the agenda. Uh, our next meeting is scheduled for, for May 4th. Kevin, unless there's anything else you want to add? Just again, I want to thank everyone for uh, your participation, but more importantly, thank you for what you're doing every day to support your uh, your groups, uh, your organizations, and your members, and uh, just keep on uh, doing the good work, and um, we'll keep plugging along here. If you have any uh, feedback or comments or you think of anything uh, related to the discussion today, feel free to uh, email myself or Karen. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.